Good morning, and welcome to worship this morning. We're glad that you're here, whether you're here in person or have joined us online all around the world. And we are glad that you have set aside this time to seek the Lord, to be with others, or to be worshiping from your home. There are several families that have told me, we get dressed, we sing the hymns, we stand, we want to make it as much like church as possible until we feel like we are comfortable to be back. But it's great to see people returning each week who have been vaccinated and now feel comfortable being with us in person. If you are someone who, who does this with your phone comfortably, we would invite you to check in this morning. The more people that post our service, we find the more people that are watching. I've had people even from other congregations say to me, I try not to miss your service on Sunday. Our pastor, David Donahue, his wife, Veronica, and their daughter, Lauren, are all in Nashville this morning. She will begin classes soon toward her master's degree in special education. So they are there getting her apartment set up and we wish her all the best as this new chapter in her life begins. We welcome Dee Whitten this morning. Dee is the executive director of North Star Church Network of which our church is a part. And he is just next door in the Rock Building. They've done some wonderful renovation that allow mission teams to come and have a great place to stay and so if you haven't been over there uh, make your way to the back of the rock building sometime and see all that they have done there uh, we're glad that Dee is with us those mission trips have uh, mission teams have started coming back and so it's great that uh, they are able to do that over this summer Dee does a wonderful job reaching out to all our churches and their um, ministry teams, and we appreciate the work that they do. It has been a good week for Manassas Baptist. We have had the Mexican consulate here. As you leave this morning, if you look down the hall, you will see all kinds of equipment. They are welcoming people again this coming week so that friends who have come to this country can complete necessary paperwork. And I'm glad that our church is able to do that. Over 40 people came to our cafeteria in the Rock Building this week to donate blood and that again is a wonderful thing. 70 plus women. Now that's not people that are 70 years old plus, but <laughs> over 70 women have signed up uh, and those reservations were due last Sunday for our fancy women's tea next Sunday. So we, we will have our fascinators, our hats, our tea, uh, and have a great time together. So if you signed up for that, uh, plan to join us uh, next Sunday afternoon. Again, welcome to worship. I would invite you to take out your worship guide and, and speak boldly in praise of God as Mark leads us in our call to worship. Please stand and join me in the call to worship. I'll read the light print and you will read the bold print if you would. The work of the creator is visible. The example of Jesus is apparent. Let's respond with obedience. The wind of the Spirit is blowing. Let us respond with joy. The Word of God is calling. Let us worship in spirit and in truth. Will you join me in singing Love Divine, All Loves Excelling?
I would ask now that you take your order of service and join me as we read responsively. Again, I'll read the light print if you read the dark. Oh Lord our God, we thank you for the many people throughout the ages who have followed your way of life joyfully. For the many men and women who have offered up their very lives so that your life may become For your love and faithfulness, we will at all times praise you. O oh Lord, we thank you for those who chose the way of Jesus Christ. In the midst of trial, they held out hope. In the midst of hatred, they kindled love. In the midst of persecutions, they witnessed to your power. In the midst of despair, they clung to your promise. For your love and faithfulness, we will at all times praise you. O oh Lord, we thank you for the truth they passed on to us. That it is by giving that we receive. It is by becoming weak that we will be strong. It is by loving others that we will be loved. It is by offering ourselves that your kingdom will unfold. It is by dying that we will inherit our life everlasting. Lord, give us courage to follow your way of life. For your love and faithfulness, we will at all times praise you. Our choir comes to share now an anthem that was featured in the movie, O oh Brother, Where Art Thou? It was hard for me to believe when I checked it out this week. That movie is now 20 years old. This was an American traditional folk song. It has a variety of titles and some word changes throughout. It was used when there were baptisms in the lake, down to the river to pray, as people were on the shore watching those being baptized and praying for them and their spiritual journey. So we invite you this morning to figuratively come down in the river to pray.
We miss WJ being here to be our amen person, don't we? <laughs> They're enjoying some time in Florida and uh, glad that their family and extended family can be down there, but we look forward to their return. As we come to our time of prayer this morning, I'd like to ask that we remember several folks who need uh, the Lord's healing touch in their lives. One of those is Irma Reedy. Uh, Irma has had heart valve surgery and uh, is recovering from that. We want to remember Grace Edwards uh, in her time of uh, health that has been a challenge. Wes Harrington has also had some heart concerns and has been in and out of our local hospital. Bill Cobble, the husband of our children's minister, Mary Beth Cobble, had hip surgery this past week and has been in quite a bit of pain after that procedure. So we want to remember Bill. Tia Hall, who is the daughter of Regina Dalton, a longtime member of our church. Um, Tia had surgery this past week, and it was the 30th surgical procedure that she has undergone in her lifetime. And due to a false positive um, for COVID, she's been placed in a different part of the hospital. Uh, she wrote on Facebook last night, it's extremely uh, discouraging. So let's lift Tia up this morning. We also want to remember Pastor David's friend, Ando, who's recovering from recent surgery. Our flowers this morning are in memory of Glenna's mom, Hazel, who was a wonderful servant of God. And the ones up in the pulpit are in memory of Pete Slusher. Over a year after Pete's passing, we had a service for him yesterday that was just really touching. And uh, I'm thankful this morning for those who paved the way for us. There's a, a lady named Jane Marshall, a wonderful musician that went to be with the Lord just recently, and she said, we always need to be thanking the Lord for those who planted and watered that dreams could come true. And so this morning, as we come to our time of prayer, I ask that we remember those, uh, including our former pastor, Ed Bratcher. I plan to speak more about him next week. Ed was here for 15 years, and I had the privilege of working with him and being mentored by him and uh, rejoice that he is now with the Lord, even as we mourn his passing. If you have a graduate in your family or know of a graduate that we should be aware of, we want to celebrate high school and college graduations. Uh, be sure to uh, send us an email, let us know, because we want to celebrate with those folks. So would you join me now as we go to the Lord in prayer? Lord, as we come this morning in the quietness and the stillness of this worship space, we are aware that you are here, but that you are here with us wherever we are, and that we are never beyond your love and care. And so we thank you for that promise that is fulfilled in our lives every day. Help us not to pull away from you when times get tough, but to draw closer to you and receive the strength that only you can give. We lift up to you these this morning that we've mentioned by name, Irma, Grace, Wes, Bill, Tia, Ando. We ask that your hand will be on them in a special way. Let them feel your presence in unmistakable ways. And Lord, let us reach out as we can to each of these to let them know that during their time of need and pain that they are not forgotten. We lift up to you those who are still dealing with the loss of a loved one because there's not a timetable for grief, Lord. Let us recall with these that we know a special time, a special memory, and even though it might bring tears to their eyes, they will realize that their loved one is still remembered fondly. Lord, we come this morning thanking you for those in this church and many other parts of your kingdom around the world that, as Jane Marshall said, have planted and watered that dreams might come true. We thank you for those who served us, pastors like Ed Bratcher, members like Pete Slusher, and all those through the years that have been faithful to following you and trying more each year to be like you. We lift up our pastor and his family as they are in Nashville we ask that this might be a good transition time for Lauren. We thank you that she is wanting to get a master's degree in special education to be able to work with those whose lives she can transform 
through her love for them. We lift up D. Witten this morning as he comes to bring your message to us. Let us absorb that message. Let it fill our hearts in order that we also will strive to be more like you. Thank you for your love and care. May we never take it for granted, Lord. We thank you most for the gift of your Son, in whose name we pray. Amen. Please join me now in singing, Blessed Assurance, Jesus is Mine. Please stand and join me in singing. morning. It's great to be back with you at Manassas Baptist Church, and I bring you greetings from the North Star Church Network, and we feel very at home here at Manassas Baptist since we have our office and our mission center in your building. We appreciate that partnership that we have with you, and our, our North Star, as most of you know, are, is an association of Baptist background churches, 170 churches in Northern Virginia, 70 of which are international congregations, very diverse group of churches in the Baptist world. And uh, we appreciate your partnership with us so very, very much at North Star. North Star's mission is to uh, energize churches to carry out their God-given mission. And we just know that at Manassas Baptist, you have a great mission from God. You have a great mission field. You have a wonderful facility that we're enjoying part of for our North Star Mission Center. A wonderful pastor and church staff and, and key leaders in the church that are doing such a great job ministering for the Lord. And so our prayers are with you at Manassas Baptist. And anything we can do to help encourage you and energize you in your mission, that's what our objective is at North Star. Well, as we begin the message this morning, let me ask you a question. How many of you have had an opportunity to watch one of the episodes of The Chosen on Facebook or on YouTube? Anybody? Um, check out The Chosen, and you can go and get the app easy. It's free app. You can get it at the App Store, download The Chosen, and in the, in the future, that's the only way you're going to be able to see this, but this is an an excellent dramatic series on the life and ministry of Jesus. It is based upon the gospel accounts of Jesus, 
but it adds some character development in the lives of the people around Jesus, the disciples and the people that are around Jesus. Uh, the Chosen is well done, excellently done, I would say, and has, a powerful, has some powerful scenes that are taken directly from the gospel account, accounts. Scenes such as Jesus turning the water into wine at the wedding, healing the leper, and Jesus' con uh, conversation with Nicodemus at nighttime. Uh, these are all excellent episodes. You would be really challenged and blessed by watching it, so be sure and check it out. One of the uh, main points of focus in The Chosen is the relationship of Jesus with his disciples and, and the calling of the disciples and the mentoring of his disciples. Thus, they get the name The Chosen, of course. And the disciples are called to follow Jesus and to be with him each and every day. And they have the opportunity to see him on a daily basis and to see how Jesus lives out his faith. See how he uh, shares God's love with others on a daily basis. How he deals with the religious leaders and how he teaches about the kingdom of God. Uh, the Chosen is, is free again. And I think they're coming out with episode four of season two even this week. But check it out on their app. Or I think maybe you can still get it on um, on. Uh, Facebook or YouTube. So that leads us right into the message title for today, Imitation Christianity. That's what we want us to think, that's what I want all of you to think about, Imitation Christianity. Unfortunately, it's not too difficult to find Imitation Christianity in our world today. Ish imitation Christianity could be called false Christianity, couldn't it? Christianity in name only. Christianity that has no connection with the message of the gospel or with the teachings of Jesus. Christianity that is strictly an outward show that has no real substance to it. It's not too difficult to find false teachers in our culture to get today who proclaim a message that has no foundation in the gospels, no foundation in the teachings of Jesus. So, Imitation Christianity in that manner is not too difficult to find in our world today, unfortunately. However, that meaning of imitation Christianity is not what we want to think about this morning. Let's think about imitation Christianity in a completely different way. The Apostle Paul writes to the Christians in Corinth and says this to them in 1 Corinthians 4, 14 through 16. Paul says, I am not writing these things to shame you, but to warn you as my beloved children. For even if you had 10,000 others to teach you about Christ, you have only one spiritual father. For I became your father in Christ Jesus when I preached the good news to you. So I urge you to imitate me. I urge you to imitate me. Remember, Jesus called his disciples to follow him, to imitate his life, his attitudes, his grace, and his love. The Apostle Paul tells the Christians at Corinth that he is their spiritual leader, their spiritual father. And so they need to imitate his life and his attitudes and his grace and his love. And of course, Paul would go on to say in 1 Corinthians 10, 33, Here's what he said, and you should imitate me just as I imitate Christ. And of course, that's the secret to imitation Christianity. Imitation Christianity is the key to the Christian life. It is the key to following Jesus. It is the key to sharing the good news. It is the key to discipleship. Also, it is definitely true that imitating others is a key component of our lives. Children imitate their parents, at least until they become teenagers. And then teenagers uh, probably began imitating their favorite rock star or movie star or maybe an older teen in their school where they participate. We all know people who have had a huge influence on our own lives, don't we? You can probably think of some folks who have greatly influenced your lives through the years. Maybe a parent, or maybe it was a teacher, maybe it was a coach, or just a personal friend who had a great influence on your life. However, the truth of the matter is that there are a wide variety of people who are imitating your life 
whether you realize it or not. And most of the time, we don't even realize some of the people that are looking our, at our life and imitating our life. And that's certainly true, though, with children imitating their parents. We know that is the case, and that's also true about close friends or, or fellow workers or neighbors. There are people who are watching your life, and they are imitating your lifestyle to a certain degree. So let's think about imitation Christianity. And the first thing we want to notice about this topic is that imitation is the key to discipleship. It is the key to discipleship. This is the theme that we find throughout the Bible. Remember, Joshua learned from Moses. He imitated his life, in a sense. And Elisha definitely imitated the life of Elijah, the prophet. And the disciples learned from Jesus. Jesus uh, the Bible says in Matthew 16, Then Jesus said to his disciples, If any of you wants to be my follower... You must give up your own way, take up your cross, and follow me. Jesus says very clearly that those who want to be his disciples must give up their own way of doing life. They must die to their old way of life, and they must follow Jesus. They must imitate the life of Jesus, imitate his actions and attitudes and grace and his love. Ray Vanderlaan has taken many, many groups of Christians over to the Holy Land to take a tour through the Holy Land. And he's produced a series of books and videos that are based upon these trips to Israel and the teaching that he provides to the folks that he takes on tours over there. And the series is called That the World May Know. Excellent series, actually. It's been around for a while. But one of the key places that he always takes his groups uh, of tour, uh, tourists over to Israel, one of the places he always takes them and focuses on is a triangle of three small towns in the northwest coast of the Sea of Galilee. Capernaum, Bethsaida, and Chorazin. Capernaum, Bethsaida, and Chorazin. Vanderlaan says that this region was the focal point for discipleship during the first century A.D., the focal point of discipleship. These three towns were all very small, maybe 2,000 people at the most. Uh, the culture of these towns was firmly rooted in family and community. Everyone knew everyone in these towns. And the people in these towns were strongly rooted in the Jewish faith and tradition. And they were focused like a laser on the coming of the Messiah. And they were yearning for the Messiah to arrive and to set them free from Rome. The Jewish boys and girls in this part of Galilee would begin their education. It was called Beth Sefer. At, they would begin their education at the age of four or five years old, and a teacher would teach these children to read and to memorize the Torah. The Torah is the first five books of the Old Testament, and uh, so they would study the Torah that would be their education. They would study the Torah, learn to read it, and they would even memorize the entire Torah. And this education continued until they were about 13 years of age. And then this was the end of formal education for most of the children. Uh, the boys began to uh, learn their family trade at that point, and the girls would learn the skills of a homemaker and prepare to be married. However, the very best male students, only a few of them, but the very best male students would continue their education in what was called Beth Midrash. And here they would continue to memorize most of the Old Testament, the, the prophets and the writings in the, in the Old Testament. And then they would uh, seek to become a disciple, or the Hebrew word is Talmud, of a rabbi. They would become a disciple of a rabbi. The student would find a rabbi that they really liked, and then they would go to that rabbi, one of the students in Beth Midrash, they would go to this rabbi and ask the rabbi if they could become their disciple. And if the rabbi said yes, and he only said yes to a few of them, most of them he turned down, but if it's, he said yes to the young student, then this young student would leave his home and would live with the rabbi and would would follow them everywhere they go. He would, they would learn to live like the rabbi lived, and they would be like the 
rabbi in every way possible. And this process would go on for years until that student would decide to become a rabbi himself. So this was a view of discipleship in the Galilee area during the times of Jesus. And this area was known all over the world in those days for being just a, a seedbed for discipleship. And people would come there who wanted to be a disciple of a rabbi. They would come to this region of the world. And the, they had a saying back in the, those days that the disciples should be covered in the dust of the rabbi. In other words, the disciples should follow their rabbi so closely that the dust that flew up from the sandals of the rabbi would cover their clothing because they were following the rabbi so closely. And this triangle of small towns had the reputation for discipleship throughout the world. And as I said, people from all over the world would come here to find a rabbi to follow. Ray Vanderlaan says this in his book. Let me just quote him briefly. He says, discipleship was at the heart of Jesus' ministry. So it's not surprising that the word disciple is used more than 100, 250 times in the New Testament. In fact, the New Testament is the story of disciples written by disciples who wanted to make disciples, and those disciples dramatically changed their world. So it is no coincidence that probably six of Jesus' 12 disciples were from the small town of Capernaum right there on the Sea of Galilee. The six were Peter, Andrew, James, John, Philip, and Matthew. That small fishing village helped to change the world and helped to change history because six of their inhabitants were called to follow Jesus. Who would have ever guessed that this small town, fishing town on the coast of the Sea of Galilee called Capernaum would be such a, would have such a powerful impact on the world. Discipleship was a core value, uh, value in the village of Capernaum. But the men who were called by Jesus obviously didn't have what it takes to be a Talmud, a disciple in those days. They finished Beth Sefer, the early learning, but they didn't go on to Beth Midrash. They went into their family business. Uh, four of them went into the fishing, fishing business, the family business. Um, but Jesus was different from the normal rabbis of his day because he did not wait for people to come to him to ask him if they could be his, uh, his uh, disciple. Instead, Jesus did just the opposite. He went after and proactively called men to be his disciple. And you didn't have to attend Beth Midrash in order to be a disciple of Jesus. You didn't have to be very smart academically to be a disciple of Jesus. Instead, the Bible tells us that Jesus took the initiative, went after these fishermen and a tax collector, and he told them, come, follow me. Come, learn to imitate my life. And that was a crucial difference between Jesus and the other rabbis of his day. And, you know, Jesus takes that same initiative with you and me today. He approaches us. He comes to us and says, come, follow me. And then the decision is ours. Do we choose to be a follower of Jesus or not? And that's the pattern of discipleship that we see in the New Testament. The disciples of Jesus called their own disciples to follow them. And that process continued on and on until the message of Christ was carried all over that first century world. Listen to what the Apostle Paul said in Philippians 3.17. He says, Brothers and sisters, join in imitating me and observe those who live according to the example you have in us. Join in imitating me, Paul said. And then Paul goes on to say in Philippians 4.9, Keep putting into practice all you learned and received from me, everything you heard from me and saw me doing, then the God of peace will be with you. That is exactly imitation in Christianity. That is the methodology and the style that Jesus intended for us to have. And the truth is, that is still the pattern that works even today, even though I don't think most of our churches have any planned programs in imitation Christianity. We probably should have because it's all about modeling the Christian faith and Christian life for others to see 
uh, your example and to, to follow the example they see. When they see Christ in you, they follow that example. So imitation is the key to discipleship even today. First thing we need to do is find healthy Christian role models and imitate their lifestyle and their habit patterns and their faith and their attitudes. All of us need to be doing that. We need to find healthy Christian role models and be imitating, our, imitating their lifestyle and their habits. Then we also need to realize that there are other people who are modeling their life after us, even though you don't, may not know it. They're modeling their life after us, for good or for bad in some cases, I guess. So it is so critical for us to be a great role model of the Christian faith in our own lifestyle. Because people are watching us. Don't think that's not true. People are watching you and they're imitating some of your habit patterns and your attitudes and so forth. So let's notice about imitation in Christianity that imitation involves prayer. It involves prayer. Saul of Tarsus was a Pharisee and a noted rabbi in the first century. You remember he was on the way to Damascus when, when God appeared to him in a dramatic way, when Jesus appeared to him, and Jesus called Saul to be a follower. He called him to be a Talmud, if you would, in the Hebrew. Uh, Saul had already served as a Talmud or a disciple to the famous Rabbi Gamaliel, but now he was being called to serve as a disciple of Jesus himself. Saul spent about seven years in Tarsus, his hometown, learning about Jesus and about the good news of salvation after uh, Jesus had called him. Then the Apostle Paul was ready to serve as a model for others to follow. And during his ministry, Paul had a variety of disciples who were modeling their life after him because he was modeling his life after Christ, right? Uh, think of names like Silas and Luke and Timothy and Aquila and Priscilla and Apollos, and the list goes on and on in the New Testament. At the end of his life, Paul writes to one of his key disciples named Timothy and has these words to say in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 3 and 4. He says, Timothy, I thank God for you, the God I serve with a clear conscience, just as my ancestors did. Night and day, I constantly remember you in my prayers. I long to see you again, for I remember your tears as we parted, and I will be filled with joy when we are together again. There's no doubt that prayer should be a key area of focus in training a disciple. Paul set a wonderful example uh, in prayer for his followers. He writes to Timothy, he says, Night and day I constantly remember you in my prayers. And Timothy knew that was true because he had served with Paul on his mission trips, and he had probably experienced Paul uh, just praying for him fervently throughout the day and throughout the evening. Remember, Jesus' disciples asked Jesus to teach them to pray. And the disciples saw that Jesus went off by himself onto the mountaintop and at other times by himself to pray. They were with Jesus when he was praying fervently for the world. One of the best ways that you can impact the lives of those who are imitating you is by demonstrating a life of prayer. How is your life a prayer? Those people who are carefully observing your life need to see you in prayer. They need to see your dedication to prayer. They need to see your commitment to prayer. They need to see your passion for prayer. They need to experience your confidence in the power of prayer. How are you demonstrating that in your life for others who are following, uh, who are following your example? Uh, maybe this uh, your children or your grandchildren or some friends, fellow Christians, to those who are imitating your life. It is time for all of us to get serious about our prayer life because there are probably a whole variety of people who are imitating their prayer life after ours. So what is our prayer life like? How, how powerful is our prayer life? How serious is our prayer life? Um, now, these friends and family members may not be saying, hey, why don't you teach me how to pray? But make no doubt, mistake about it. They are observing your prayer life and imitating your prayer life in many ways. You can have a huge impact on the lives of these people by strengthening your prayer life, by having boldness in your prayer life. I'm often, um, as I am a proud grandfather now of six grandchildren, 
Uh, I'm just uh, constantly watching them pray at dinner time, and I can just see that the example of their parents coming through to them and the prayers that they pray at, the, at mealtime. And that's so encouraging when I hear some of these great prayers that are prayed by my grandchildren. I can name fellow Christians throughout my life who have been friends of mine in churches that I've pastored throughout the years who have been great prayer warriors in these churches. And they have had a tremendous influence on me uh, in their prayer life and their commitment to prayer and their, the dynamic uh, way that prayer influences their life so powerfully. So uh, imitation, uh, imit people want to, it's important for us to in increase and improve our prayer life so that imitation Christianity will prosper. But also imitation involves not just prayer, but faithfulness. Listen to what Paul says in 2 Timothy 1, 5 through 7. He says, I remember your genuine faith. Talking about Timothy again. I remember your genuine faith, for you share the faith that first filled your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice. And I know that same faith continues strong in you. This is why I remind you to Fan into flames the spiritual gift God gave you when I laid my hands on you. For God has not given us a spirit of fear or timidity, but of power, love, and self-discipline. That is a wonderful passage of Scripture in which the Apostle Paul emphasizes the power of imitation. Paul claims that Timothy's grandmother, Lois, and his mother, Eunice, had a profound impact upon Timothy's life and Timothy's faith. Their faith in Jesus had a huge impact on young Timothy. And of course, Paul realized how much Timothy had been imitating his own life. Paul had even fanned into flames the spiritual gifts God had given to him. In other words, Paul had provided a powerful blessing to Timothy. And that blessing involved spiritual power and love and self-discipline. For most Christians, the most critical role modeling takes place with their own children. And you know that to be the case. Do not underestimate the power of imitation that you have with your children and that you have with your grandchildren, of course. There's no doubt that they are imitating you, again, for good or for not so good. So take that responsibility very, very seriously. A parent's faith can literally steer the course of a child's life. The power of imitation is so strong. Your children and grandchildren need to see your faith in action. They need to see the fruit of the Spirit in your life. They need to see the grace of Jesus in your life. The, the tr your trust in God, your personal and positive uh, attention to uh, the ways of the Lord. And the list goes on and on. This is also true for teachers, for coaches, for children's ministers in churches, for youth pastors, and the list goes on and on. Any any adults that have influence over children. Don't underestimate the impact that you have on others because of the power of imitation. There are people who are imitating your faithfulness to Jesus Christ. So imitation involves prayer and faithfulness, but finally, imitation involves the good news. In 2 Timothy 2, 1 and 2, we read these words. Paul says, Timothy, my dear son, be strong through the grace that God gives you in Christ Jesus. You have heard me teach things that have been confirmed by many reliable witnesses. Now teach these truths to other trustworthy people who will be able to pass them on to others. These two verses are the key to the spread of the gospel in the first century and also in our day. Paul reminds young Timothy that the gospel is the grace that God gives us through Christ Jesus. That is the gospel, the grace that God gives us through Christ Jesus. Timothy has heard Paul teach this good news on many, many occasions. And now Timothy needs to imitate Paul and teach this same gospel to others so that they can imitate Timothy and pass on the same gospel to even more people. It's all about imitation. Paul says, imitate me and others will imitate you, is what he's saying. That's how we can reach the world. For Jesus Christ. I believe I told you the story before when I was with you about Charles Allen, the great preacher from the last century, um, and he figured out that if you take one Christian and that Christian 
led one person to Christ during the course of a year and discipled that Christian is really the key to this story. If, he, if you reach one person, one Christian reaches one person for Christ during the course of a year and disciples that person, uh, then you have two Christians. And if both of those Christians go disciple, uh, reach somebody for Christ and disciple that person for the next year, you got four committed Christians. And if each one of those four the next year uh, each reach one person for Christ and disciples that person during the course of the year, you have eight uh, Christians. And then those eight Christians do the same thing. You have 16. And just in a short length of time, the whole world could be one to Jesus Christ. In just 32 years, the whole world could be one to Jesus just by that simple methodology. So you can reach all of the Manassas area in easily 15 or 16 years. The whole Manassas area, Prince William County, surrounding area in just 15, 16 years, which is reaching one person for Christ during the course of the year and providing some discipling for that Christian during the course of that year. That is the power of imitation Christianity, using your influence as a Christian to reach people for Jesus. Just imagine what kind of impact Manassas Baptist Church could have on this community if uh, Manassas Baptist, if, if the members of Mass, Manassas Baptist, the, the uh, Christians, the disciples at Manassas Baptist got serious about sharing the gospel with at least one person during the year and discipling that person so that person could imitate your life and become stronger in Christ. And then for the next year, that person would go out and reach somebody else for Jesus Christ. That would be, that would have a powerful impact on this whole region for Jesus Christ. And that's, that's the pattern of the Bible, is imitation Christianity, imitating others who are following Jesus, but allowing others to follow your life and imitate what you're doing, and you're passing on the Christian values to those that are following you. That's how we do discipleship in churches. That's how we should be doing discipleship in churches. So let's bow, bow together for a prayer. Father, we just thank you so much for Jesus, and we thank you for the, we thank you for his life, we thank you for his love, we thank you for his ministry, his miracles, we thank you for his message of the gospel, and we thank you especially for his death on Calvary's cross, and we thank you for raising him from the dead to prove your victory, his victory over sin and death and hell. Lord, help, I just pray that each one of us will renew our faith and commitment to Jesus Christ. Help us to follow him. Help us to imitate Jesus. And thereby we can be a influence on others around us who might be imitating our lifestyle, our attitudes, our love, our grace. Lord, help us to put this imitation Christianity into practice in our own lives. Help us to be very, help us to do it not just by accident, but help us to do it very intentionally and very proactively, growing our faith and trust in Jesus so that we can pass on that same gospel and that same fruit of the Spirit to others. Lord, that's the commitment that we want to make right now to you, that we're going to just focus on imitating Jesus and, and then allow your spirit to flow through us to touch the lives of others. And we just pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. If you would like to make a decision of your life to Jesus Christ or renew your commitment to Jesus or, or get more involved in what's going on at Manassas Baptist Church, please seek out one of the leaders of the, the church and talk to them, and they would be glad to help you in that very, very important process. Please join me in singing, Tell the Good News. Please stand and sing.
Christ sends us forth. Be my abide in my love. Love one another. Go forth to serve. We will go forth in love. Share in my mission. Bear fruit that will last. We will, we will go, go forth as your friends, friends rejoicing. Let us go forth in peace to witness to our community and the world that Christ is alive.